Yes, thank you. That's lovely. Okay, perfect. So I realize I don't have a ton of time and I've probably got too much information. So I will uh, do what I can to skip things that I think uh, could be left for later. I'd like to begin first by thanking Professor Hugh Houghton for accepting my proposal for this year's Birmingham Colloquium. Also wish to thank uh, Father Justin and the St. Catherine's Monastery for permission to use their digital images, which you see on the right there, from their recent digitization project, which is both for the Sinai Palimpsests and their digital library, as you see from the links below. There's been a recent surge in scholarship on the Arabic versions in the last decade and a half, though it's only possible to name a few here. There are a couple of PhD dissertations, one by Hiknak Kashu on the Arabic versions of the Gospels, Sarah Schultes on the text of Vatican Arabic 13 and 1 Corinthians, a couple of articles by Juan Monfrer Sala on Matthew 13 and Philemon in Vatican 13, Vivian Sakai on three recensions of the Pauline epistles, and uh, the one I will refer to most here, Jack Tanus, has a short article on the same manuscript, Sinai Greek, New Finds Majestical 2, easier to say is MG2, so I'll be saying that for the rest. So there's been a lot of interest in the field as of late. However, when one peruses the introductions to the standard critical text of Nestle Allen and UBS, currently NA28 and UBS5, there is no reference to the Arabic versions, nor are they cited in the apparatus at all. A note in the introduction to UBS3 mentions that it cites Arabic versions rarely, but even that note and presumably any rare citations of the Arabic versions has been dropped altogether in the UBS5. Seems that in a time when the Arabic versions interest in them has increased, it remains incredibly difficult for the Arabic versions to gain a hearing for their testimony to the history of the New Testament text. MG2 is the only known bilingual Greek Arabic manuscript of the Pauline epistles, including Hebrews, and it's written in two columns, as you can see by the picture there. Though there are other bilingual Syriac Arabic, Coptic Arabic, Karshuni Arabic, one known trilingual Greek Latin Arabic manuscript, and one five language Ethiopic, Syriac, Coptic, or Arabic, and Armenian manuscript. The Greek column of MG2 has Gregory Allen number 0278 and is one of the consistently cited witnesses in the NA 28th edition, though not in UBS 5. As part of the theme for this year's colloquium, this paper examines the fragments of MG2 and Romans in the first two folios. In this 2019 article by Tanus, he presents 15 test passages throughout the entire Pauline corpus comparing the Arabic to the Greek columns and also to the Syriac Peshitta. He tentatively concludes that it follows the Syriac relatively literally, but notes that there are several places, especially in Ephesians, where it reads with the Greek against the Syriac, and he suggests it might have been corrected against the Harclean Syriac version. However, he only includes Romans 1-3 in his test passages, and the present study examines the entire extant text of Romans in an attempt to determine its relationship to the facing Greek column and to determine its forlaga. Rather than beginning, or Tanus did by comparing the Arabic to the Syriac in places where it disagrees with the Greek column in wording or phraseology, though this is an important second step, I think it's necessary first to establish how the Arabic text relates to the entire Greek textual tradition in places where there's known Greek variation. This allows one not to assume at the outset that differences between the Arabic and Greek columns are due to a different forlaga. To locate instances of Greek textual variation, I have consulted the references here. And then, of course, you see Horner's Coptic version, and then uh, for the Syriac, I've used all in Unicol's Dasnoia Testament in Syrischer and Uberlifrun. Uh, and then just the one reference to the old Latin witnesses, uh, I've consulted uh, Houghton's work there. When possible, I have checked von Soden's variants against the digital images of the manuscripts from INTS VMR. Uh, in the extant part of Roman, part of Romans, in MG2, there are 52 places of Greek variation, which I have listed in the following slides, using the Nestle Allen 28th edition as the critical text. 14 of these are relevant for understanding the textual complexity of MG2 and identifying its forlaga, which I have highlighted in red and blue, their agreements and dis disagreements respectively. For certain variants, I have listed Arabic manuscripts that have significant agreements or other interesting readings. After a brief review, really brief of all 52 variants, we'll then consider the 14 that are important for the text of MG2. On this slide, I just wanted to point out a, a couple of the variants in 1.4, in particular, the Yesu Christu, and then the Kriyu one. Uh, you'll notice that this trilingual manuscript, uh, which is minuscule 460 for the Greek column, that has Yesu Christu on the Greek and Latin columns, 
but it only has JC along with minuscule 57. Mar Marciano Greek 379 is what's called for the Arabic uh, in that particular reading. But then they switch where the Greek and Latin columns have Theu and uh, the Arabic column has Kariu for that. So the Arabic column has uh, basically Jesus our Lord, whereas the Greek and Latin have Jesus Christ our God for that particular one. It's kind of an interesting thing I thought I'd point out. Uh, in this next slide, it's incredibly difficult uh, to determine prepositions, but when I look at this in more detail below, I'll, I'll talk more about that. This is difficult when you're looking at virginal evidence as well as a Mumoy variant, but I think it's pretty clear this one in particular. And then the Atois Hautois is on one that we'll look in more detail as well. One of the ones here in Romans 126, I want to consider. Um, I put a vid here because it's not cited in any apparatus, but I think this the Peshitta reading as well as the reading from MG2 follow the addition of Prasin uh, in these minor uh, readings from the Western cluster as well as the Vulgate. And then we'll talk more about 127 also later. Uh, for 129, which we'll look at here, yep, let me just go back to this one real quick. An interesting reading, just to show you how the Arabic versions do have some interesting readings from time to time, are these two Arabic manuscripts that agree with the omission of Hotheos uh, in Romans 128, along with the original hand of Codex Sinaiticus, um, Alexandrinus, and you know a couple others that you see there. Finally, Rome, Romans 129, the vice list. I created a separate reading for the Peshitta here because uh, I think it is necessary to show the order as it compares uh, with the manuscript MG2. So that's just the quick overview there. There are 14 variants out of the 52 in the extant portions of Romans for comparison. And six of these, those listed in this slide, all three that I'm comparing here, both uh, 0278, which is the Greek column, MG2, and all the Syriac versions agree in all six of these uh, where they're extant. There are two places where one cannot determine the agreement, uh, partly due to the Greek text here for 1.9, uh, where you have a hole in the manuscript right where you would see the, you can see the mu there right before the hole, so you can't tell if it's mu or moi. And then uh, for 125, you can see the idicism in 0278. However, um, neither Syriac nor Arabic have the dative case, so one cannot really say whether or not they follow the reading of MG2 in that particular reading. For the remaining ones, there are two agreements of the Greek column with the Arabic column against the Peshitta. For this one here, just want to highlight really quickly the different differences uh, in the prepositions used here. Like I said, this is kind of difficult to determine precisely, but you'll notice in 1.3, without textual variation in the Greek is peri. And then in 1.8, of course, is where we have our textual variation. The Syriac uses the same preposition both times. The Peshitta uses all and the, the Harclean uses Naptal, but they use the same preposition both times, which I would argue means that they have Peri both times. And in fact, when you look at the back translation in all in a Nucles edition for Romans 1, 3, and 1, 8 for the Harclean, it does have Peri both times. Whereas if you look at the Arabic uh, column for Romans 1, 3, it has Peri as Allah. And in 1, 1, 8, it has An, which I would argue the change in preposition means that it's following its particular Greek text there. I added a couple different refer references where huper is used and extant in either the Syriac or the Arabic and the Greek here. Uh, and especially for the Arabic column, you see in Ephesians 6, 18 to 19, where 0278 has huper for both verses, even though it's not cited for 618 with that reading, uh, the Arabic has on both times. For the next agreement with the Greek text against the Peshitta is really just one of order. I've highlighted there where you can see the reading of the vice list. There are some holes, but I think even though we put vid in the apparatus, it's pretty certain of the order of the Greek column here. The Arabic does follow it, except for if you look at what I have for MG2 there, it has the wow a conjunction before each of the terms, just like the Syriac does. The difference is for the Syriac, it swaps the last two terms, Kaki and Pleonexia, which the Arabic does not do. So I'm counting that as a disagreement uh, between the Arabic and the Syriac. For the other four readings, 
the Syriac and the Arabic agree against the Greek column. This one in particular is, here is a little bit difficult uh, simply because one can look at the verb ginemai and it could be translated to be born with that particular semantic range. Uh, and that is a possibility when you look at uh, Liddell Scott, Bauer and Gitchin Docker and all these different uh, lexicons, it is a possible reading. But I've put up all the versional evidence there for the two being a menu. Uh, so you can see uh, the Old Latin, the Vulgate, both Coptic versions, the Harclean, and several Arabic manuscripts there all understand that particular verb uh, in the sense of to be or to become or perhaps descend from and not in the sense of being born. The only versional evidence that has this reading is of course the Peshitta Syriac and then these Arabic manuscripts that have a strong connection to that reading. The difference is, whereas the, the Peshitta uses a finite verb in the perfect, the Arabic uses the participle, which may one may we lead one to believe that it is doing something to correct that to the participle in the Greek column. Further complicating this is that in Galatians 4.23, the Greek column misspells the genetai, as you can see on the bottom line of this particular slide, as the like genetai from genomai, and the Arabic translates them both as to be born. So could it be translating the Greek column and not following the Syriac? That is certainly a possibility. Uh, based on Galatians 4.23. As for the other Greek, three Greek variants where the Arabic column disagrees with the Greek column, in Romans 1.24, it's fairly certain that MG2 agrees with the reading of Tois against Tau Tois of 0.278. Uh, although there is a hole, as you can see in the screen there, um, in the, the image next to MG2, it most likely has the reading Biha with a circle and a period inside of it for the end of the clause there. It's probably what's in that hole. Regardless, if you see the last line, Romans 127, where it does translate how tois, uh, that particular word, him could not fit where that hole is. So I think the reading how tois for MD2 here is pretty certain. In Romans 126, I've highlighted in blue the places where it seems to have a translation of the word krasin a second time, even though it's a verbal form in both the Peshitta, which is at the end of the verse, and the Arabic because of grammar issues, it, it transfers the verb to the beginning of that particular clause. Um, there are two Arabic manuscripts, MG2 and ANS 327, that both agree with that verb along with the Peshitta. So uh, one may question whether or not this is an agreement with the Western cluster. However, uh, MG2 is definitely reading with the Peshitta in this particular reading. The next one in 127, um, there are a couple of pieces of this that show it reads with uh, the Syriac against 0278, which is why I've expanded it, not just to include the te, de, or the omission of either of those in 0278. Um, for MG2, it has a very similar structure to the clause. It moves the homoios to the end of that particular piece. It adds the uh, possessive object suffix to hoi arsenis, which is basically their males. Um, and it has something that represents at least the chi and either a te or a de. Now in Arabic manuscripts, the proclitic particle fa often translates the word de. And so I think what has happened here is clearly it doesn't follow the Greek in the omission of one of these. Um, it seems to, uh, what it does is know the reading of the Peshitta with the additional te and follows it nearly exactly, but conflates the, another reading with de. So that one has is, is multiple ways of saying pretty much the same thing. Well, I didn't find that. So, and also now that they, they're males. And so I think it's a conflated reading, but it definitely does not read with its Greek column. So in summary, we have two that are undetermined, but one where it's clear that Syriac and uh, the Peshitta in particular and MG2 agree. And in the remaining 12 variants, we see that it agrees with its Greek column only eight out of those 12 times for 66.7%, but it agrees with the Peshitta in 13 readings for 84.6%. So 
uh, it's important next to take a look at where the Arabic column disagrees with the Greek column, but where there are no Greek variants to see if this trend continues. It's helpful, first of all, not to assume a literal translation strategy without further examination. For instance, um, I'll look at the second one there, Aphoris Menos, the Arabic has Aledi Ufariza, who was set apart, which is a relative pronoun plus the perfect passive verb, which could validly translate the Greek participle. It's only when you look at the Pasheta, which does the exact same grammatical construction, third person singular verb, a passive form plus a relative particle, that it sure seems like it's, it is following the Pasheta for that reading. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the minor differences really quickly and then move on to some of the major differences that really show that this trend is still the case, that the Arabic seems to have a Syriac for Laga, in particular the Pasheta. So with the indefinite versus the indefinite, uh, there's some standard uh, readings for Jesus the Christ in Arabic that is always this way. And so it's really a minor difference that can't really point back to whether or not it reflects a definite or indefinite text. So Yesu al Masih is the way Arabic writes Jesus Christ, regardless of manuscript. There are only three that ever do it differently, or they will occasionally, uh, based on a Greek variant, have the Messiah Jesus instead of Jesus the Christ. Same way with God, when it refers to the God, it's always Allah, which of course is the Islamic way of saying God as well. And uh, Holy Spirit is always Ruh uh, regardless of where it occurs, which is also the form used in the Quran in Surah 2, 253 that I've noted there. Um, here's some more of those indefinite versus definite. Uh, noticing the agreement, because Tanus pointed this out with the Harklian, uh, it agrees eight out of eight times, but of course, this is just the Syriac emphatic state, uh, and one should not make too much of that particular agreement, as it also agrees with the Peshitta six of eight times. When we look at the singular plural differences, we start to see that uh, if you look at the top of the slide here, it agrees with the Peshitta four out of four of these times, and with Harklian zero out of those. And so you start to see that it doesn't agree with the Harklian really much at all in more significant types of variation. You've got the add omit of possessive suffixes or pronouns. Uh, there are only six of them here, but it agrees with the Peshitta text all six times and none with the Harklian text. Um, there's a noun and construct versus adjective noun. I can't get into the grammar right now. It's a little bit different. Sometimes the Arabic will have a noun and an adjective where the Greek has uh, a genitival relationship. So in 126, you see that, Pathe Atenias whereas the Arabic has um, a noun with an adjective. So these are those differences between the Arabic and Greek columns. Uh, and as you can see, it follows the Peshitta three of those times and the Harklian only once. Uh, so there's a summary. The total at the bottom, 20 out of 33 times uh, that it follows the Peshitta versus 19 out of 33. And primarily those have to do, uh, the strong agreement with our plan really is about the definite and indefinite, which uh, I would say is not as significant as the rest of the ones that we have seen. When we look at the major differences, here's where we really start to see a, a, a strong connection to the Peshitta that there are differences. So we've got changes in word, or, word order, grammatical changes, added omission of words or phrases, and so we're going to look at a few verses here, uh, but to save time, I'm not going to look at, at every single one of them. Um, Romans 1.3, uh, this is one of the ones that Tanus points out. It's got the addition of um, the word L in Arabic, which means family, which seems to reflect the bite of the Syriac Peshitta. So the house of David or the family of David, David but it's not exact. What's interesting, again, the Quran has this type of language for the family of Moses and family of Aaron, and uh, this Arabic text seems to be reflecting that. One of the, the more interesting ones here, and more significant, I think, is the transposition of what in Greek is karasarka, right after the verb to be born, which the Peshitta does, but the Harklian does not do. And so you start to see some of these types of things that the Arabic text is doing. So there are similarities, as I've, I kind of listed on the slide here, it's similarities to the Greek that are different from the Peshitta. So it's got the participle like the Greek does. That's the only similarity. The differences from the Greek that are similar to the Peshitta, the verb meaning to, born, to be born, the transposition, and the addition before David, 
However, what you see is there are differences from the Greek and the Peshitta, so the Arabic manuscript is doing something different there. So it has the word body for flesh, which is also found in 13 of 20 Arabic manuscripts that I've looked at in this verse. Looking at a couple more of these major differences here, uh, Romans 1, 4, um, the by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, alive from among the dead. Again, you see some similarities to the, the Syriac Peshitta, and you see some differences. By uh, When you look at, in particular, what it adds to from among the dead, seems similar to the Peshittas from the house of the dead ones, but it's not the same. So maybe there's some influence there, but it's unclear what that particular influence is. It seems to be a Peshitta for Laga, but the Arabic manuscript seems to be changing some things too. Um, this resurrection of Jesus alive from the dead is not found in any other manuscript that I have looked at in my studies in Arabic, nor any versions that I have found. So it's doing something here that seems interesting and could be related to some of the different uh, theological controversies going on during this time period. So here we have the transposition. Um, we have the transposition um, so that what the Arabic text reads, uh, I have it in English there, in all the nations so that they should obey the faith of his name, which is also found in, in the Peshitta reading. So what it does is um, it takes, um, it transposes the nations to um, the beginning and it, it changes the verb form to, and instead of the faith of his, on behalf of his name, it changes it to a verb and it says so that they may obey the faith of his name, which is the exact thing that the Syriac Peshitta does in that particular instance. Uh, I'm going to have to skip just a couple of these because my time is getting uh, short here. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out here where it's different than the Syriac text. Uh, if you'll see in the Arabic, even if you can't read Arabic, I put them in bold. There are two words here, um, one towards the beginning, which is to the right side, and one towards the end, where it has some additions that are not found uh, in the Syriac or the Greek. So it adds the verb, and they were stirred up. Uh, it transposes um, the next verb before shamefully. So where the Greek has taint um, it has, it switches the verb and it has a finite verb there uh, before that. And so instead of um, they worked the shame or the shamefulness, uh, it changes it to an adverbial type of form. And then finally, towards the end, it says that they should receive it. So the Arabic, um, that in particular, is an, an addition of a second verb there, so that it was necessary that they receive it, which perhaps was felt uh, necessary for the Arabic grammar. There are a couple of additions here. Uh, one of them in particular, so it follows the Syriac and wording all the way through here, except for the, in bold case, the additions. Um, one is that they should know God in the truth of his knowledge, which seems to potentially reflect someone who's dealing with the theological controversies at the time. So they have to know God truly, as opposed to maybe, you know, other various sects of Christianity or perhaps the uh, Islamic relationships where they uh, charge Christians for uh, believing in the, in the Trinity and believe that God is one. So it could reflect the milieu of the situation of what was going there. But then the second one that I've highlighted there is it has two verbs where one would not expect them in, in Arabic. So, which really doesn't mean, it's really hard to translate it in Arabic. I put so that they are doing what is not appropriate to it. So are doing. Um, there are only a few Arabic manuscripts that do that. Whereas in the Syriac, what you have is uh, the finite verb and imperfect plus a participle. The Arabic seems to be a botched attempt to try to translate that in particular. Um, and so reflects a relationship to the Syriac. So in summary, for these particular slides, it's almost as different from the Greek and the Syriac, or sorry, it's almost as different from the Syriac as it is like it. So in 19 instances, it has some divergences from the Peshitta text, though in 20, it is very similar. Some of these seem to be related to it anyway. Some are related to Arabic grammar, 
and two are also found in other Arabic manuscripts and could be related to a connection to the, the Arabic textual tradition as a whole. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude here so that we can, uh, can wrap up our time. After examining 14 Greek variants, 33 minor and 33 major differences between the Greek and Arabic columns, the results indicate that it is a complicated text. The scribe of this exemplar clearly knew both Greek and Arabic as the columns and folios maintain strict alignment in the Greek and Arabic translation, with the only exception in the transposition of Romans 1.5, though the verse ends at the same general location in both columns. There are so many places where it follows a Syriac Peshitta nearly word for word, and yet there are other instances where it cannot be translating it, such as when the word order and grammar follows the Greek column exactly against the Peshitta. One also wonders if there's an influence from the Western cluster of readings from time to time, as that would best explain some of the variants found in MG2. There are no obvious mistakes in copying that would suggest this is a copy of an Arabic exemplar, but there's too little of a Roman's extent to make a definitive decision on that front. Though probably not an original translation, MG2 seems to also be influenced by the Greek column and occasionally alters the readings of his Syriac philaga to conform to it, for instance, that changed the participle in Romans 1.3. Although it agrees with the Harclean Syriac version in nearly all instances of definite versus indefinite differences, this can be explained by other means and there are too many disagreements with this version that it does not appear to have any influence on the Arabic column of this manuscript. In partial agreement with Tanus, then, I would tentatively posit that this is a translation from the Syriac Philaga, the Peshitta, using Quranic language at times and corrected not against the Harclean version, but against the Greek column with some influence from other Greek manuscripts with some readings of the Western textual cluster and from other Arabic manuscripts as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dwayne. So lots of material there um, to engage with. And as the applause hands um, vanish, if anybody would like to put a hand, uh, raise a hand up, I see a hand raised already. So um, or, or write your questions in the chat otherwise, particularly if you need to dash away, but you'd like to leave a question for Dwayne, do type it in the chat. But um, Christina, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you, Twain, for this uh, flood of examples in the most positive sense, I could say. That this was really impressive. And I love primer, so I love all the things you've pointed out. But I'm absolutely literate when it comes to Arabic. So I may ask a couple of really foolish questions, but I'm really interested. So let me say that first. Um, so I think, I mean, that was impressive with the Peshitta and coming from it and the template. But could it be, I mean, you said, if I remember correctly, that this bilingual has other Pauline epistles in there as well. Could it be that other Pauline epistles have other templates? Do we know anything about it? Or, I mean, yeah, that, that would be one question. I have a second later on, please. Yes, it hasn't been studied all that much. An article by Tanus just, just looked at a broad range across the entire um, Pauline corpus. It only has the Pauline epistles, and some of them are really fragmentary. Uh, for instance, Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Uh, but no one has really looked at the, its text, the Arabic column, in uh, the rest of the manuscript. I did notice an interesting Western reading in uh, Philemon 1, just because I happened to, to be trying to look for different things. It has the reading Toa del Fo, uh, that edition uh, that's in the original hand of uh, D06 there. And it's just, it's, it's interesting that it has a couple of these readings here and there, but it doesn't have all of them. So, you know, the Greek column doesn't have that reading, the Arabic column does, the Peshitta doesn't have that reading. And so one wonders what that influence might be. Yeah, one really wonders. <laughs> yeah, okay, so one could that, take that further. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and the second question is, you mentioned the participle, and I think it was on the Greek genomenu and whatever the Arabic was, but yes. um, I, I, I've had this theory for a long time that uh, participles are rather revealing when it comes to comparing versions, because sometimes the other language cannot do it. I have spotted mm -hmm. this when, when working with Coptic and also with Latin, when, I mean, like uh, participles for words like to be uh, do not exist. So may I ask you a grammar question here for the Arabic, mm -hmm. because you said that is the, the Arabic just has the participle as the Greek. So can the Arabic imitate everything that the Greek has in terms of participles? Because Greek is, has really everything. I mean, like a middle voice and, and all the other things. Or, I mean, is it just the fact that it is a participle? It, it can imitate Greek participles wherever it 
uh, if it were literally translating the Greek. Uh, you find this in a couple of other Arabic manuscripts that are definitely uh, Greek for login. So Sinai Arabic 155 in this case would have a participle pretty much every time the Greek has a participle. Um, this particular one in that reading in 1.3, it does have a participle where the Peshitta does not have a participle. And so I mm -hmm. thought that was perhaps some influence from the Greek column where there is a participle. In other places where the Greek has uh, participles, it'll translate it with a finite verb, either in the perfect or imperfect. It just sort of depends. Okay. But it seems when it does that to be following the Peshitta for those readings instead of the Greek column. So uh, and whether or not it's influenced by its own Greek column or some other Greek text, it's just hard to know uh, yeah. for certain. Okay, well, well, thank you. That, that was really fascinating. So good luck. Thank you. Mr. further work. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. In the absence, I don't see any other questions. So could I ask um, Duane about the use of the manuscript or the purpose for which it was produced? Have you, do you have any sense of that in terms of um, what you've investigated so far? I've wondered about that. Uh, it seems like its original home was not in St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, but it's unclear where it came from. The only colophon it has uh, just says basically that it arrived at the monastery. I don't know that it even gives a date for that. And it says where it came from, only God knows, basically. Um, <laughs> so I've wondered what the use might be for it. Um, private study, maybe, though, you know, the Greek column, if you saw that, that first slide, does have some marks for um, the lectionary. Um, so it's hard to say for, for certain because it seems to not come from the Melkite community really, which is you know, the Arabic speaking church that, uh, that followed the Roman uh, Byzantine practice, even though it has the Greek right next to it. Uh, I'll have to pursue that further, but uh, didn't really have any final determination there. Well, thank, thank you for that insight. Well, I think then um, we'll stop formal proceedings at this point. Um,